Ever had a mountaintop experience with the Lord? Not many mountains down here in the flatland, are there? Well, this past week when I went to Maryville, Tennessee to be with my daughter while she was having her knee surgery, and I thank you for your prayers and your concern for us while we were away. I had one afternoon that I got to take a trip and I drove down from Maryville down through Townsend into the edge of the Smoky Mountains, took a left turn and drove down Main Street, Gatlinburg. Mountain tops. When you get in that part of the land, there's all kinds of mountains there. There's tall ones, there's short ones. Right now, there's a lot of them that you can see the damage left over from the raging fires that were there just a few months ago. And as I drove through there, I was trying to take it all in. I was trying to imagine what it must have been like for those persons who were living there, particularly in the Gatlinburg and Sevierville area, when the mountains were ablaze with fire and smoke and the wind blowing 60, 70 miles an hour, fanning ashes all over the mountainsides and places far and near. And while I couldn't imagine that, I could remember a time when I was in high school. I was a member of the KVG. Anybody know what that is? Keep Virginia Green. It was a part of the in our high school, it was a part of the FFA group. You know what the FFA is? Future Farmers of America. And where I live in Montgomery County, if you looked right out the front door of my house, there's this really tall mountain. It's called Poor Mountain. And somehow a fire had started on that mountain, and so they called out you can believe it, teenagers from the KVG group to go up on that mountainside to work towards putting that forest fire out. And all you had to work with was a rake. And what we were trying to do was to clear a trail just wide enough so that the flame wouldn't come over and spread further down the mountain. But while we were there, the wind picked up, and I looked up, and there were literally flames that were going back over my head with a fire that was raging on that mountaintop. It took two or three days to get the fire out, and when I came back home that night, I could sit on the front porch at the house and look over to Poor Mountain, and it looked like it was a whole city from little pockets of fire here, there, and the other. And that was the last time I fought a forest fire. Well, in this biblical account this morning, we have two mountaintop experiences. The first one was with Moses when God calls him up to the mountain and gives him the law to share with the people. The second one is with Jesus has gathered with his inner circle of disciples, uh, Peter, James, and his brother John, and they go up to the mountaintop, and while they are there, Jesus was transfigured. <coughs> I've tried to picture that in my mind, what that must have looked like. It says that Jesus' radiance was brighter than the sun, and that his clothes became dazzling white. Sorry to say, but the closest thing I could come to it was back in the 60s when black lights were all the rage. If you had anything that was white and held it under a black light, it would just glow like the Dickens. 
So it must have been a very impressive sight for Peter and James and John to, to see this taking place and really not understanding what was going on. And so Peter, who was one who never minced at word, just couldn't contain himself. He says, oh, it's good for us to be here. Uh, if you'd like, I'll build three dwellings for you here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And about that time, a bright cloud covers the mountaintop, and the voice comes. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Elijah and Moses. No. Listen to him. I'm pretty sure they didn't have any idea as to what was coming as they made their way towards Jerusalem, even though Jesus had told them on more than one occasion that, that he was going there. When he went there, it wasn't going to be a pleasant experience. But it was important for these disciples to listen to Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to listen to Jesus. Now there's a difference between hearing Jesus and listening to Jesus. This is a difference between hearing someone and listening to them. Because Jesus had much more to offer to these disciples than any of them could comprehend at that particular moment. And he was about to do so in, in a way that none of them would have ever dreamed was a possibility, even though he had told them this is what was going to happen. They were hearing him, but they weren't listening to him. Now, it's awfully easy in these days in which we live when there are so many voices clamoring about so many different things in so many different directions and trying to tell us this and that and the other that it's possible for us to, well, be so involved with what's going on in the world that we can ignore Jesus. Do you know why we gathered here this morning? We gathered here to worship and to praise God. Now we can do a lot of other things when we come to church, but that's really what we're here for. And, and to praise God is something that's far different from just simply reading words, going through motions, but it's actually opening your hearts and minds and spirits to the presence of the living God. A pastor was telling a story about he was in a preaching seminar in a Pentecostal church. And there was a worship service there and the people were there and they were singing their songs and worshiping and he was standing beside this one fellow that just kind of drifted away from everybody else. And he went over to the side and it kind of got his curiosity up as he looked at this fellow and he went over to the side of the, the room where they were. He just lifted his hands and he says, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And this pastor says, well, he was genuinely worshiping the Lord from the depth of his being. And he thought about what he did that morning when he got up. He got up and he said, Lord, my back's killing me. A big difference, isn't it? <laughs> A lot of times what we seem to be thinking is worship and praise of God is really to bring to him our list, our laundry list of those things that we want God to deal with because we, quite frankly, just don't simply know what to do with it. And so we offer the list and 
move on, go back to our regular routines. But how often do we just simply say, I love you, Lord. Jesus, I love you. I bow my life before you. Close your eyes and envision the face of the living Lord. As we enter into this Lenten season this week, we have the opportunity to gather, and it's not all about what, how we can beat ourselves up or deny ourselves a chocolate donut or some other thing that, you know, we probably needed to do anyway, <clears throat> personally speaking. But it's about taking the time to come into God's presence, perhaps at first in silence. We don't do silence well. <laughs> we really don't. And we discover that when, even, when we're trying to do silence, really there's noise going on in our heads anyway. We're thinking about, oh, well, I got this to do, I got that to do, uh, I need to go there, I need to see this per uh. I once heard someone talking about prayer, and they mentioned the fact that, you know, whenever they prayed, they found out that they were being interrupted by their thoughts about other things. Have you ever considered that those other things are the things that God really wants you to be praying about and to be involved with. So I hope that we'll take the 40 days that are a part of the season of Lent to simply to do what we can to in some way to express to God our love and adoration for what he has given to us in the gift of his son. And that we'll earnestly try to listen to him, to hear his voice above all the other voices in the world that are clamoring to be heard. And to discover anew what it is just to simply to say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you. And to have our lives transformed by the power of that love that God also has for us. If we do that, it's no telling what might happen. but I suspect it'll be worth it. Listen to him. You remember the story of Elijah when he defeated the prophets of Baal, how he ran from Jezebel and went and hid in the cave. He went in the cave and there was a mighty wind that came, but the Lord wasn't in the mighty wind. And then there was a fire that came and he wasn't in the fire. Remember what the next thing was? The Bible translates it, the still small voice of God. But what it literally means is that God was in the awesome silence. So may God grant us the ability to be silent in the presence of God. So that we truly may come and share and lift up our hearts in praise with those words, I love you, Lord. So be it. Amen.